Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining our webinar this afternoon. Before moving on to our speakers, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Keith Farmer, a commercial communication specialist at the Fisher Scientific Channel. The Fisher Scientific Channel has put together a programme of webinars to support our customers and will continue to offer exciting and informative webinars to help keep you informed and engaged. You can view our upcoming webinars and revisit the previous ones by visiting our webinar webpage, which you can access using the link in the program section of our homepage and also under events and exhibitions, which you can find at the bottom of our main web landing page. Please be aware that we are recording this webinar and it will be made available on our website later on. Now I'd like to introduce you to my colleague Ingmar Rupp. Ingmar is another commercial communication specialist here at the Fisher Scientific Channel. He is here with me today and will now tell you how the question and answer session will work. So over to you, Ingmar. Are you on mute, Ingmar? Thank you, Keith. Yeah, sometimes that happens. Okay, mm -hmm. good afternoon. I'll be your chat master for today's webinar. You have entered the webinar on mute, but you are able to unmute yourself at the end of the presentation to ask any questions you may have. You can also ask questions as we go through the presentation using the chat function, and we'll cover these at the end. To ask your questions, please click on the red arrow, which allows you to hide or expand your control panel. You will then be able to enter your question in the chat. I'll hand back to you now, Keith. Thanks, Ingmar. So today our webinar will be introduced by Chris Hogg. Chris is a marketing communications manager at DWK Life Sciences and has over seven years experience in scientific marketing roles. After this introduction, Hanin Alazawi will then discuss safety considerations when working with glass products in the lab. Hanin is a market segment manager for the lab division at DWK Life Sciences. After working as a researcher in human genomics and cancer, Hanin obtained a PhD in mammalian epigenetics from the University of Nottingham in the UK. She then moved into a commercial role with a focus on helping today's laboratory scientists find the right tools for their application. Rachel Adams will then explore safety considerations when working with plastic products in the lab. Rachel is a product manager at DWK Life Sciences, specialising in laboratory plastic wear. She has a degree in biological sciences and has worked in the scientific sector for 30 years. She has worked extensively with both equipment and plastic consumable products, supporting a wide range of users within the clinical, life science, biotech and industrial markets. So now I'm going to hand over to Chris, who will start off the, the presentation. OK, thank you, uh, Keith, and thank you, Ingmar. Can everybody hear uh, me OK and see our, our presentation on the screen? We can. Brilliant. OK. So, yes, thank you for joining today. So the topic of our webinar is uh, making safer lab wear choices with DWK Life Sciences. So just before I hand over to Hanin and Rachel, I'm going to give a bit of an introduction to DWK Life Sciences for those of you who don't know us or may be familiar with some parts of our business, not all. So we are a leading manufacturer of laboratory glassware and plasticware that's used in many applications from life sciences and chromatography all the way to general liquid handling. Uh, you'll most probably know us through our brands, which include Duran, uh, Wheaton, Kimball and Pyrex glassware, quick fit jointed glassware and Aslon and, Pla Aslon and Wheaton plasticware. Uh, now, on the next slide here, you can see as a company, we have a long heritage in the manufacture of labware. You can see here our route actually go all the way back to Otto Schott's invention of borosilicate glass in 1887, and the founding, of course, of Wheaton uh, and Kimball too. Now, basically, if you fast forward to the present day, we brought all these different strands of business together in 2017 under the one DWK Life Sciences umbrella. But anyway, that's enough of the history. You're not here for a history lesson today. As I mentioned, we're going to talk about safety in the lab, and we're really looking forward to sharing our knowledge with you. So let's start with some tips and tricks on how to work safely with glassware. And I'm going to hand you over to Hanin. Go, Hanin. Thanks, Chris. Right, let's spend a bit of time talking about basic lab safety regarding glassware. So here's a little overview of the contents that we've got for you. We'll look at selection criteria, inspection of glassware, 
user considerations and how you can reduce the risks. And we'll also talk a little bit about the disposal of glassware. So um, glass is not a liquid, a solid or crystal. So it's usually described as amorphous. And this structure makes it quite brittle. And because glass doesn't contain planes of atoms that can slip past each other, there's no way to relieve stress. And so when excess stress forms, um, this forms cracks. And um, that, at that point, there's a surface floor. So glass can be extremely fragile. And as a result of this, if it's bumped or dropped, um, or if there's too much pressure applied to it, or if there's a drastic temperature change, it can easily fracture and it can even explode, which results in accidents. Some glassware accidents don't need much more than a plaster, um, but others can result in much more serious injuries. And another consideration is contamination from the materials in the broken container, which can sometimes be a problem. Glass has some great characteristics, all combined in one single material, and that means you can use one container for many purposes. It's highly transparent, and that's probably the reason that it was used by alchemists, because they could see what was happening in the container, and you could see gold being formed from lead. It's got excellent chemical resistance, and so it can be used with pretty much any chemical without concerns, although there are some exceptions. It's impermeable to gases, which is very important to some applications in chemistry, where you have materials that are sensitive to some gases. And it's also got very good thermal shock resistance. You can go all the way down to liquid nitrogen temperatures and all the way up to several hundred degrees. It's also non-porous, so it can be easily cleaned, sterilized, autoclaved and depyrogenated. And as a material, it forms a strong, rigid and stable container. So safety really begins with quality and also um, selection criteria. So there are two types of glass that are commonly used in um, the lab, uh, and that's soda lime and borosilicate. Soda lime is usually used for disposable glassware, so things like pasteur pipettes and culture tubes. Um, and this application tends to not involve heat, and it would be something where chemical resistance and maybe pH sensitivity aren't important. Um, and the formulation is very simple. It's sand plus soda plus lime. For a silicate class is more commonly used for lab glassware. Um, and this was originally invented by Otto Schott around 150 years ago. There are two types, 3.3 and 5.1, and it's used to make a range of products from beakers to volumetrics to chromatography vials. The big advantage of boros silicate is that it's got excellent thermal and chemical resistant pro properties. So it works really well in the lab, especially when we're heating glassware, using solvents and such. And in co contrast to soda lime, boros silicate contains boric acid, which gives it its elastic properties. It's also very important, um, a very important consideration for the safe use of glass and labs. Um, is the coefficient of expansion. This is how much the material changes in volume when it's heated or cooled. The lower this is, the safer the material is, as it will stand up to much higher temperature changes. And here you can see that soda lime has a very relatively high um, COE, typically nine compared to the borosilicates. Um, there are no standards in place for soda lime glass as well. Um, so, and that means there's no standardization around properties. So it's very much potluck with what the exact composition of a soda lime product is. But in contrast, borosilicate products are typically highly regulated and they do have an ASTM standard. 3.3 um, also has an ISO standard. So all manufacturers of these products must conform to these guidelines. So it's very tightly controlled. Borosilicate 3.3 is regarded as a very safe material um, as it has a low coefficient of expansion and it's been tried and tested for a long time in the pharma industry. It's tightly controlled and we can rely more on the purity of 3.3. For example, if we need to ensure there's no heavy metals present. Um, now let's take a look at um, labware and inspection of labware, which is also very important. 
So we should really be inspecting labware before each use, and that's even before the first use, when you first purchase a glass product. And we should also be wearing protective equipment for this. Um, Equipment-specific safety precautions should be followed um, to prevent broken glass injuries by selecting and using proper PPE. And process-specific PPE may include uh, cut-resistant gloves, full-length lab coats and gowns, and maybe a face shield and some safety goggles. These provide protection of the skin, including the forearms, fingers, and the eyes. And all research labs should have cut puncture resistant gloves like Kevlar or Deflex, and an improved sharps disposal container large enough to contain broken glass. Inspection is the first step before working with any piece of glass. In addition to the dimensional inspection, quality inspectors check for chips, cracks, and blisters. One thing that's important when inspecting is lighting, so usually you require 1000 lux and this alongside a black and white backdrop can really help to improve the visibility when inspecting the glass. In terms of selection of materials, borosilica glass is a very good choice because it's highly resistant to most chemicals that you're likely to use and virtually all organic substances. Only very hazardous substances at high temperatures, for example, hydrochloric acid, will degrade the glass. Some care needs to be taken with alkaline based cleaning temperatures, um, which can cause corrosion at high temperatures, but it's best to avoid cleaning above 70 degrees and also to keep the cycle as short as possible. It's also a good idea with glass, wa glass washers to prevent glass to glass contact as this can damage the glassware. Um, avoiding glass to glass contact is also a really good idea when storing the glassware too and it's best to place the glass products on shelves or in cupboards but not touching each other. When storing glassware uh, remember to keep it away from the shelf edges in case it, it's knocked over and falls down. Metal spatulas or metal clamps can actually scratch glassware so it's best to use PTFE coated versions of these and also to avoid abrasions and serious personal injuries. Um, Spatulas used to scrape solids in glassware can be a bit of an issue. We do offer some products that assist with lab safety. Um, for example, here you can see Super Duty, um, and these are products which feature a reinforced rim and in some cases reinforced walls. And this includes products like beakers and volumetric wear. And we also get a lot of feedback from our customers that these products can last longer than conventional glassware. Um, especially if they're frequently being used in lab washes, so they can be a more economical choice. Um, this is probably a, a quite a common incident in the lab, um, broken pieces of glass, um, for example, filter flask arms, which are attached to hoses. Um, so we recommend using alternatives to these, um, for example, a pl plastic tubing with just a glass flask, or plastic, a plastic screw thread in connector for an Earl and Meyer flask. Um, and dropping. Dropping is a really obvious problem with glassware. It may break or it may not break, but even if it doesn't break, it may be damage, damaged and it may fail later down the line. So we recommend that if you do drop glassware, you actually dispose of it and you don't use it any further, even if it doesn't break. And this shows a carrying system that we've developed for larger bottles, the Duran bottle carrying system. Large bottles can be really difficult to handle when transporting and when pouring as well. So we developed this bottle carrier to facilitate this. And you can see in the video that it's much more controlled and pouring becomes much easier when using the Duran bottle carrier. Um, we've also developed a version which allows two people to share the weight of the bottle and that's typically used for larger volumes such as 20 litres. And this is something we often see, bottles being tipped to get the maximum liquid out of the bottles and this is quite common in HPLC labs and it's quite risky because the bottle can actually tip and spill. We do offer a solution to this problem. Um, this is the Duran 
HPLC conical base reservoir bottle, um, which has a conical base, and this allows maximum recovery from the bottle without the need to tip it, so it's a much safer option. And if you're using jointed wear or doing any sort of clamping, it's really important to ensure that the vessel is clamped correctly and having the clamp near the base of the flask is less likely to stress the neck of the flask. Um, and we also need to pay attention to fittings. Um, after tubing, the many different types of glass fittings present the next biggest potential for accidental cuts. Um, from the barbed glass nipples to the ground glass joints, when it comes to um, making fittings, problems arise. So take care when making and also undoing connections as well. We also have a range of safety coated glassware. So the major advantage of the plastic coating is that it protects from some of the disadvantages of glassware. It protects from scratching. And also if you do drop the bottle and it breaks, the plastic coating keeps everything together. And this gives you more time to transfer the contents from the broken bottle into a new container. And this is um, the Duran utility bottle. So we launched this next generation lab bottle several years ago, um, and many of its features focus around safety. The bottle's slimmer, so it has a much smaller diameter, and it has side grips to prevent slipping with wet hands. The cap is cone-shaped, and this gives a much more secure grip than a conventional cap, which prevents droppages. It also includes colour-coded tags so that the same labware can be used in specific experiments. Um, and when you're working under pressure or vacuum, this is quite challenging um, for glassware. You do have to make sure you're using the correct glassware for this application, and it's important to inspect the glassware before each use as well. So when you're using glassware in a vacuum application, we should be using vacuum rated heavy wall glassware like Duran Pressure Plus, for example. Um, we do offer a small range of pressure resistant lab bottles, so Duran Pressure Plus, and these will allow safe working under vacuum up to 1.5 bar. Um, some customers actually use them for shipping as they're a, ro a more robust version of the standard lab bottle. So some general tips for heating glassware now. Um, number one, hot glassware looks the same as cooled glassware, so it's really important not to touch it and we should be using protective gloves as well. So typically borosilicate glass can be heated up to 500 degrees, but this might be limited by any accessories like a plastic cap, for example. Um, in thermal shock, so when something experiences a quick change in temperature, like freezing, borosilicate is really suited to this as it's quite resistant to thermal shock. Um, ideally, a water bath should be used for heating over flames as it's safer. If you're using a hot plate, then we should be starting in the lowest setting and adding the glassware to that lowest setting, um, not just starting on high from the get go. Um, it's important not to let the contents of the container boil dry because the product can then overheat and it can introduce thermal stress, which isn't visible. And related to heating is autoclaving, which is extremely common in the lab. And we recommend that only borosilicate glass is autoclaved and not soda lime glass. When you're autoclaving, uh, we should be wearing full PPE and some liquids and media are prone to foaming. So don't fill the container more than three quarters full. This will allow liquid expansion and prevent overflowing. It's also very important not to fully tighten the screw cap because then the bottle can become pressurized and might explode. So always adequately loosen the cap to prevent the pressure from building up. When opening the autoclave door, be careful for steam um, because it gets hot and also give the products time to cool before you handle them. Without adequate cooling, some liquids can boil when disturbed and there's a safety issue there. Now we're moving on to disposal. So it's really important for lab safety that glass is disposed of properly. All glassware should be disposed of in the proper labelled receptacle. 
Avoid handling broken glassware unless you're wearing proper PPE, including eye protection, gloves and lab coats. And um, broken glassware should be free of chemicals and biological hazards prior to disposal. We should be putting glass in a puncture resistant box labelled broken glass um, and secured with tape and then placing the box um, in a trash dumpster. So in summary, um, be aware of the manufacturing and the quality of the finished product that you're purchasing, but purchasing because this really does influence performance and safety. Um, and make sure that the application and the product are suitable. Um, and think, you know, am I working under pressure? Do I need pressure resistant glassware here? And also consider thermal shock and the effect that sudden changes in temperature might have. Um, now I'll hand over to Rachel and we'll talk about working safely with plastic wear. Right, thanks Hanine. Um, it's great that at DWK we can actually talk about both glass and plastic wear. So I'll be going through some key considerations when choosing plastic wear and we'll take a look at some safety in the lab plastic products and how to dispose of them and then I'll end with a summary. So there is a wide range of plastics available in the marketplace so selection is key. Plastics have increased in everyday lab use and there are plastic alternatives to many of the glass and metal products already in the laboratory. When selecting a plastic, you'll need to consider the application and the user requirement and the, and the following properties. So some of the properties may make them particularly suitable where others could rule them out. Uh, these are chemical resistance, transparency, temperature, and also the sterilization method. So with chemical resistance, always consult a resistance chart. As you can see here, there's a wide range of polymers to choose from, going from PT and PTG right through to PTFE. The ones at the lower end of the chemical resistance range, uh, such as PT, PTG and polystyrene also fits there as well tend to be more relevant to biological applications. And the more resistant polymers where you move through to HDP and specifically PTFE, they tend to be more relevant to industrial applications where there are more harsh chemicals often used. There is an online chemical compatibility calculator on the DWK website, which is ideal for selecting specific chemicals. So if we just have a quick look at that now, I'll just take you to um, that area on the website. So here we are. So this is on uh, the DWK Limited website. So you can select a chemical, um, say acetone, and maybe a polymer. Um, let's choose polystyrene, for example. So it shows that acetone isn't um, a suitable, or the polystyrene vessel or container isn't suitable for use with acetone, either at room temperature or at elevated temperatures. Maybe if we have a look at polypropylene, for example, so polypropylene um, has good chemical resistance at room temperature, um, HDP, not HDP, Maybe let's have a look at uh, PTFE, for example. So PTFE is a highly resistant material. I do know that LDP uh, does have limited resistance, um, but LDP wash bottles are made of LP, LDP, for example. So it does have good resistance for a limited period of time. So maybe not for storage purposes, but um, you know, for, for short periods of time. So it's a really great, uh, it's a really great resource and something that both yourselves and, um, you know, end users can use. So I'll go back to the um, presentation here now. So uh, there are implications in plastics of chemical incompatibility. There are some short term effects. So you can see here that there is a polycarbonate bottle which has had acetone in it. And that's resulted in clouding. As you can see, the bottle at the back, that's the original bottle which has glass-like transparency. 
and the bottle at the front there has, uh, you know, that's not compatible with the acetone has become cloudy. Um, so polycarbonate is inherently a clear material uh, and that's the impact that it has. And you can also see here a softening and bulging which has distorted the bottle. Um, and then we can see more long-term effects of using a chemical or a reagent with a product where the polymer isn't suitable for use. So here you can see a polystyrene container that's been used with an incompatible chemical. And over time, it's caused cracking and crazing. And you can see here on the right also, you get some de discoloration. Um, and this can occur in similar circumstances also. And these are all aspects that you need to be mindful of when selecting the correct um, polymer for your specific applications. So there are a lot of user um, applications and processes that have specific temperature requirements. Uh, many applications often require freezing or the heating of samples, either for storage or processing aspects of certain experiments. So again, always consult technical data for minimum and maximum resistance of polymers. An example here is PTG, where you can see a minimum brittle temperature of minus 40. There you go. And a maximum temperature of 70. So this container can be frozen. If you need a low temperature, low temperature storage at minus 80, then you will be looking at other materials such as um, LDPE or HDP uh, and polycarbonate. Regardless of the polymer specifics, it's always good for the user to evaluate their process initially just to be sure that the chosen product is suitable. So never always rely on the uh, stated data. You know, if it's if it's a critical um, product for a user's process, then it's always advisable that they evaluate the product themselves. So as with chemical resistance, there are also implications to temperature incompatibility. And certain polymers um, that are not intended to freeze become brittle when taken below their brittle temperature. Here you can see when it's um, been dropped, it's cracked. And then, you know, once it's cracked, it compromises any sample within the container. And a lot of, you know, customer samples are either um, valuable or even hazardous. So, you know, protection of the sample is really paramount. The autoclaving of glass bottles was mentioned um, previously by Hanine, and this a similar, um, you know, a similar kind of process applies to plastic bottles. So you need to ensure that when you autoclave um, suitable plastic bottles, so that's bottles that can be autoclaved uh, and can be taken to that temperature, that um, it needs to, you know, the bottle, it needs to be with the cap fully disengaged or ideally removed to prevent the buildup of pressure and implosion of the bottle. And this is what you can see here. So this was autoclaved with the cap on and the pressure, um, the pressure buildup has caused the bottle to implode. And even when you take the cap off, it doesn't return to its original, um, it doesn't return to, return to its original shape. Uh, the last image on the right shows the result when a polymer is taken beyond its maximum temperature. And here you can see you've got distortion. The bottle's taken um, above uh, a, a temperature that it can ordinarily withstand, and it's caused a collapse of the bottle. Um, so as you can see, choosing the correct polymer with the right uh, resistance criteria in this instance, uh, temperature resistance, is really very important. So as with, uh, so focusing on autoclaving for a moment, as more and more people are autoclaving and reusing product where possible. And so polypropylene can be autoclaved at 1 to 1 and PMP, which is polymethyl pentane, can be autoclaved at 135 degrees centigrade. In addition to autoclaving, there are other methods that can be used to sterilize plastics, which can't be taken to such high temperatures. And this could be um, ethylene oxide gas and e-beam sterilization. 
as I mentioned before, it is very important that prior to autoclaving, um, products are cleaned because they can contain hazardous materials that can generate toxic fumes or present a fire hazard. And specifically with bottles, care must be taken to ensure that the cap is completely loosened or ideally removed to prevent the implosion that we saw on the previous slide. Uh, and it's shown here as well. So reattaching the cap before the bottle is sufficiently cooled will also cause deformation of the bottle. Uh, so once autoclaved, you need to ensure both the bottle is fully cooled prior to the cap being reapplied, as implosion can still occur by reapplication of the cap to a warm bottle. So these are just aspects that you need to be mindful of when you're autoclaving um, plastic products. Transparency is another important aspect of selection criteria for users. Um, some users may be managing biological or clinical samples where there's a need for clear visibility of the contents within the container, as they could be looking at maybe turbidity, um, debris or other visual aspects of the contents. Polycarbonate, PT, PTG, polystyrene all offer very clear material. Polypropylene and LDP is a more translucent material, um, but you can see that there are contents within, but you just don't get the clarity, the glass-like clarity that you do with maybe PT or PTG. And to the far right, of course, we have the more opaque uh, polymers, and the example given here is PT, PTFE which is um, opaque and it doesn't offer any visibility of contents at all. However, you know, it is one of the most chemical and temperature resistance materials. And so it is certainly very popular in the industrial sector where product will be exposed to more aggressive materials and environments. So to support the online reference tool for chemical resistance of plastics, we also have a very handy A5 pocket size card, which really summarizes both chemical resistance and also physical properties of key plastic products used in the laboratory sector. And it's really an ideal, um, you know, it's an ideal support tool for lab users it's, it's laminated so you can wipe it clean and then put it in the lab coat pocket. It's just a great reference guide um, for both lab users and salespeople. It's, you know, it's that uh, handy reference tool. So I'm now very briefly gonna cover some plastic products that offer safety aspects within the laboratory. And the laboratory provides controlled conditions, which is important for scientific research. Um, but people are using both valuable and hazardous compounds. So it's really important that both personnel and work are protected where possible. There are a number of safety features uh, of plastic products within DWK, which support this. And I'll run through these briefly now. So firstly, let's look at spill protection. Wash bottles are used in pretty much every day um, in virtually every laboratory for safe liquid and solvent dispensing. The issue with solvents is that whether in an everyday lab, on a window ledge in the summer, or as is the case in many laboratories now with more automation, it tends to be a warmer environment. And once solvents, um, you know, once the temperatures of solvents are elevated, it starts to generate vapors, which causes a buildup of pressure inside the bottle. If there's nowhere for the vapors to escape, the increased pressure forces the solvent up the tip of the spout. And you can see that here. So you can see the dripping on the bench. Um, so it forces them up the spout. And this is where you get a steady drip. Um, and it could be distilled water, but it could be potentially hazardous and flammable liquids on the laboratory bench. So within DWK, we have a wash bottle range, which has an integral vent, and you can see this detailed at the bottom here, which allows gases to escape um, 
and, and it allows the pressure inside the bottle to equalize so it prevents that buildup of pressure and elim it eliminates any issues of solvent dripping on the bench and really it's an ideal solution for many, many laboratories certainly where they um, are using solvents so this video helps support this Okay, so the next products offer smart and safe coverage. So in the laboratory, there are beakers and flasks and other, um, other laboratory apparatus that are open either to the environment um, and therefore environmental contamination or also accidental knocks and spills. An ideal solution for these scenarios is provided by the Duran silicon lids. And these silicon lids fit flush to the container, preventing accidental spillage, whilst also providing coverage against potential environmental contamination where needed. So it's a great product range and ideal for most labs. Also from a sustainability perspective, they can be repeatedly reused and either washed in a conventional laboratory dishwasher or autoclaved. And they're available in a range of sizes to suit, as you can see here, to suit um, most laboratory containment devices. So this video helps to show how effectively they perform, especially with liquid spills and containment. So staying with the topic of sample security, most samples um, users are working with will be valuable and in some instances hazardous. So we'll need to be protected and leak free performance with bottles therefore is critical. And also I should say uh, to be expected. So within DWK, we offer a range of bottles which has dual seal closure, ensuring there's an excellent fit between the bottle and the cap to provide a leak-free performance. This was something which was alluded to during the glass presentation about the quality of product and the quality of supporting performance. And this is certainly applicable to this product range with the engineering and design aspects of the cap and the neck area of the bottle. So looking at safe transportation, um, there has been a lot of laboratory consolidation. So transport of samples either internally, often via pneumatic air transport systems, or externally by road or air. These often present, these methods of transport and, and sample movement often present quite challenging conditions for the valuable sample and the device in which it's being transported. So DWK offer a range of vials designed with excellent seal performance, enabling them to meet both the rigorous Department of Transport and International Air Transport Association regulations. So leakage can be hazardous as there are often contaminated patient samples. It, it can be costly also if say a sample needs to be replaced and it can also be dangerous um, if, a, if a valuable patient sample is lost uh, as this would delay diagnosis and also any subsequent treatment required. So safe transportation and leak-free performance, you know, again is extremely important. Earlier in the presentation, it was mentioned that glassware is prone to breaking. Plastic is an inherently more resilient material. So when accidentally dropped or subject to similar mechanical stresses, it's less likely to break. Uh, and this protects both the user and also their valuable work. And it's ideal for areas really where glassware is prohibited for that very reason, such as food manufacturing, um, educational establishments. Plastics can be a, a great and 
safe alternative to uh, many items offered in glass. So sustainability is a really hot topic globally, and it's certainly something of, of interest to me personally. So the recycling of plastics is, is really important. Mm -hmm. And here you can see the polymer and associated recycling codes that I'm sure many of you are familiar with and have been used for, for a long time. So when, you know, in your organisations, all plastics recycling must be done in accordance with whatever the recycling policy is. And care should always be taken to ensure that when necessary, the plastics have been safely decontaminated prior to disposal to ensure that this is done safely. To summarise, plastic has greatly increased in popularity for everyday laboratory use and certainly reusable plastics is, um, you know, increasing in use. As you've seen, there's a wide range of plastic options to suit most user applications and when looking at plastic alternatives, always consult physical and chemical resistance criteria of the plastic before making your choice. The robust nature of such products does make it ideal for situations where glass breakage would be particularly hazardous and glass is not allowed in certain environments. So I hope you found this informative and thank you very much for listening. And I'll hand back to Chris now who will bring the session to a close and maybe address some of your questions. So over to you, Chris. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Hanine. So, just a quick uh, wrap up from me to say that uh, some of the products obviously you've seen today, and also the tips and tricks and advice, uh, much of this can also be found on your regional Fisher Scientific website, uh, and of course, as well on the DWK.com website too. Uh, so, you can also contact the DWK team at any time via our website. We also have a technical inbox in case any of you have any specific questions. That's technical at DWK.com. And you can always keep in touch with the latest from ourselves via our social media channels. So uh, at this point, I think it's probably best to hand back to the official scientific partners uh, who I think are going to have a look through some of the questions that might have come in. Is, is that right, guys? That's perfectly right. Thanks a lot, Chris, Hanin and Rachel. Um, so I will run through the questions now. Um, first of all, I'd like to start with a question. What is the best solution if you want to heat contents over the flame? So over an open flame or a hot plate? I mean, so if you're, if you're going to heat contents, really, you need to use glass. Although a lot of plastic products can be taken to higher temperatures can, and can be autoclaved, they shouldn't be used over an open flame. So in those instances, really glass is um, the best solution. And I think, yeah, specifically yeah. borosilicate glass as well, Correct. because that has the most superior temperature resistance, especially when you've got a lot of nasty chemicals yeah. mixed in there as well in the lab. Perfect, that brings me to the next question that came up. Are there any particular considerations to take into account when choosing between glass and plasticware besides hot, plates or fl open flames? I think it really depends on the application. Um, definitely depends on the application of, of the specific user in the lab. There are, you know, glass has some really great qualities, but, you know, in some situations, like if you're working with hydrochloric acid or at higher temperatures with hydrochloric acid, or even in some cases, sodium chloride, you would the, it would be preferable to use plastic because it will damage the glass. And also if you're in environments where, you know, where it was mentioned previously, where glass is prohibited, then you would use plastic educational establishments, you know, where there is the likelihood that maybe less experienced people will be handling some of these products for safety aspects, then, you know, maybe, maybe plastic in those instances might be, um, you know, the preferred material. And then if we think about cell culture as well, you know, I'm sure people in cell culture would love to use less plastic, but 
um, it's easier to sterilise. So it, at the moment, there just isn't an alternative to that. Great. And talking about plastic, um, you mentioned that sustainability is a hot topic right now. So how can we use plastic more sustainable, uh, sustainably in the lab? I think, you know, we can reuse plastics, you know, plastics last so long as they're cared for. Yeah, and we, we do have information on our website on the care and, you know, washing of plastics as we do glassware too. So I think just making sure that you, um, you know, you, you care for the products sufficiently, um, you know, with volumetrics, there's, there's glass volumetrics as well. So when you're washing them, you don't take them above a certain temperature and that makes that ensures that the accuracy remains for the volumetrics so you can, you can use them for a longer period of time so you know sustainability is key and having plastic you know reusable plastics you know addresses a, a lot of issues and you know going forwards i think as an organization you know, as with many organisations, we're going to have to think more about the kind of plastics that we yeah. use as well. And it, as, a, as a company, it is something that's that's really, you know, in our mindset at the moment and something that we're definitely looking into. So, you know, we're, we're you know, discussing and talking with customers and understanding their concerns and and trying to look for options where we can it's not always possible but where we can to address this and going forwards you know it it will impact some of the products and you know hopefully improve some of the products that we can offer to you we absolutely understand you because we've been there too um so there are two questions left and i try to sum them up so um Two questions in one. Could you once again compare the advantages of glassware to those of plasticware? I mean, so, so I mean, gla glass and plastic. So, I mean, glass, I think, where you've got the higher temperatures, there's nothing that leaches from glass. So, where you've got, you know, really critical products, glass is a, a very, very inert product. So, you won't get anything that leaches from glass. Um, and it can withstand, you know, its chemical resistance and, and the high temperatures, certainly for borosilicate glass are, you know, e extremely, um, extremely good. With plastics, I mean, plastic is a, is a more robust material. It does, it does have um, very good chemical resistance and also uh, temperature resistance as well. And it's lighter. And exactly, it's lighter. So there are instances whereby maybe people need to ship samples and, and glass just wouldn't be um, a, a sensible option to yeah. ship samples in glass. And a lot of people use plastic bottles for transportation rather than glass bottles. Yeah. So, you know, within DWK, I, th I think that the glass and the plastic products complement each other and work hand in hand. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it, isn't it? It's a very difficult question to answer by saying it is one or the other. I don't think it ever is, is it? It's a case of the application yeah. and what you're looking to do. And hopefully that's where some of the information we showed you today in things like the tips and tricks content, and for example, your plastic compatibility yeah. calculator, hopefully allows users to sort of make those decisions rather than seeing it as a binary choice. It is more a case of just seeing what would yeah. work in that particular yeah. scenario. I'm sure that what you showed us today will help people a lot. And that's all of our questions today. So I'll hand you back to Keith now. Thanks, Ingmar. Okay, we've come to the end of our webinar this afternoon, and I'd like to thank you once again for joining and also thank our presenters, Chris, Anine and Rachel, for a very interesting and informative session. Before leaving you, just a quick reminder to keep an eye on our webinar page to look out for webinars that may be of interest to you in future. So have a great afternoon and goodbye for now. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank Bye. you. Bye.